Okay, so a very good evening, everyone. Thank you ever so much for joining us on what is a very sunny summer evening. And we're going to have a look at some radiographs this evening um, in what is uh, the uh, July LVS film reading session. So uh, hopefully all of you can hear me. Um, something that I will ask is if you guys just mute your mics, um, unless you're contributing to the discussion, and that'll help reduce the amount of feedback that we're getting on the recording. So for those of you who are new to these sessions, um, I'll introduce myself before we begin. So my name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. Um, I graduated from the RVC in 2003. Um, I got my RCVS certificate in diagnostic imaging in 2009. and I got my diploma in 2018 after a three year residency spent at the Royal Veterinary College. And these days you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is the only multidisciplinary referral hospital in central London. Um, if I can be of any assistance whatsoever to you guys, um, if you'd like to have a chat about the most appropriate imaging study for any particular patient, or if you have some radiographs that you need a hand with, then don't be a stranger. Um, you can drop me an email at this address um, or drop me a line um, via the telephone number that's on the screen right now. So these film reading sessions are interactive sessions, uh, so uh, you guys hopefully will have had a chance to have a look at this evening's cases. So there are four cases that we're going to discuss. Um, what uh, we're looking for um, is uh, some um, active discussion um, amongst the group and in order to achieve that, um, hopefully you will have had a chance to produce um, a very short radiology report that consists of a uh, radiographic description, um, including all of the key features of the radiographs that you think help uh, with compiling your differential diagnosis um, and a conclusion section um, and also some recommendations. Um, so uh, before we move on and I open up the floor to some of you guys who are going to take us through some of these cases, let's just look at an example. Um, so this is a case that we looked at a few weeks ago. Um, it's a 15 year old domestic short hair cat that presented with dyspnea and we're only going to look at a single view as this is an example. So we've got a single um, right lateral view of a skeletally mature cat and this is a thoracic radiograph and we can see that there are multiple mineralized foci throughout the pulmonary parenchyma here and um, the distribution um, is uh, quite interesting. So uh, they're distributed in a branching pattern throughout the pulmonary parenchyma. So we could describe this pattern as an, an arborizing pattern. So arborizing is a nice word to use if you see something um, that um, looks like a tree um, that has um, kind of a, a, a stem and then multiple branches that extend towards the periphery. And there are a few other changes here as well. Um, so we can see that the diaphragm um, looks very uh, flattened. Um, we've got an increased distance between the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette um, and the diaphragm. Um, and also because these uh, lungs uh, look uh, quite large, um, so we've got hyperinflation of the lungs, they're looking hyperlucent, uh, we can see some of the edges of these lung lobes as well. Um, so uh, this patient um, most likely has uh, multiple um, bronchioliths, and those bronchioliths are most likely associated with an underlying feline asthma that's resulted in some air trapping, um, some pulmonary emphysema um, and hyperinflation of those lung lobes. So that was the case that we looked at, um, like I say, a few weeks back in one of our previous film reading sessions. Um, so today we've got four new cases for us to review. And like I say, this is very much an interactive session. Um, our first case is an orthopedic case. It's a 10 year old male neutered Labrador that's presented lame on its right forelimb. Um, so we've got a couple of views for you to have a look at. We've got a dorsopalmal view of this right carpus. We've got a mediolateral view of the right carpus. And then just to make things uh, a little bit more convenient, and we've got both views displayed on the same slide. So uh, who is feeling in an orthopedic mood this evening and would like to maybe present case number can I have a go at it, please, Ian? Absolutely, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, sorry, let me just pull it up. Um, so, kind of starting with the dorsopalmar view. Um, 
on the lateral surface of the distal metaphysis of the radius, um, I think there's an ovoid shaped radiolucent lesion. Um, in terms of kind of cortical destruction, um, I wasn't entirely sure what type. Um, I thought it was maybe more consistent with permeative. Um, I couldn't really see kind of the moth eaten holes or kind of geographic. So I thought it was maybe closest to kind of coalescing. Okay. Um, I think there's an irregular periosteal reaction. Um, I can see kind of one very small columnar projection, um, but there's only one. Um, so perhaps it's maybe better described as um, speculated. Okay. Um, I think it has a short and distinct zone of transition. Yeah. Um, there's some soft tissue swelling. Um, I can't see the lesion on the orthogonal view, um, but I think the periosteal reaction there seems maybe more regular um, rather than irregular. Um, so for, for conclusion, um, I know you only kind of need one feature of aggression and there's maybe two here. Um, so I've kind of gone with a monoostotic aggressive bone lesion at a predilection site for osteosarcoma. Um, okay. Could also be osteomyelitis, but I thought kind of biopsy staging. Um, and if it is that, then maybe surgery and chemo for the best survival time. OK, yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's all uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, so I mean, hopefully you guys, I can see the lesion here. So um, we have this uh, area of lucency just on the medial aspect of that distal right radius. And um, as we discussed, uh, there are a few features of these sorts of bone lesions that we need to be aware of to try and decide whether or not this lesion is most likely to be an aggressive lesion um, or a benign lesion. Uh, now, the things we touched upon are the location. Um, so this um, is a predilection site for um, primary bone neoplasia. So it's, it's away from the elbow and it's in the region of the distal right radial metaphysis. Um, so um, neoplasia like osteosarc needs to be on the radar here. Um, we need to look for any evidence of cortical destruction um, and certainly that um, medial cortex looks a little bit discontiguous here. Um, we can see nice clear margins on the lateral aspect of this radius but adjacent to this lesion um, it's looking a little bit irregular and certainly as if there is some cortical destruction there, which is something we'd expect to see with an aggressive lesion. Um, the zone of transition as well can also give us a clue as to whether a lesion is aggressive or benign. Um, actually here, the, the zone of transition is, is pretty short and pretty clear. So um, in terms of describing the lysis here, there's three different sorts of bone lysis that we could potentially describe. Uh, we've got um, the um, permeative lysis, which is sort of the, the most lytic and the most indistinct, um, then moth-eaten, um, which uh, is a little bit more distinct than permeative. So with moth-eaten lysis, it, it looks like there are multiple holes, so um, numerous poorly marginated radiolucent, uh, focal radiolucent areas. Um, and then we've got geographic lysis, which is usually most clearly defined. Um, and here, I, I might be inclined to call it geographic lysis um, rather than either moth-eaten um, or permeative. And um, geographic lysis, so uh, a reduction in the density of the bone um, with a short, clearer zone of transition, that is something that you maybe associate more with a benign lesion. Um, <coughs> however, like I said, we have got this area of cortical destruction, um, which uh, is not something that you'd expect to see with a benign lesion. Uh, we've also got this sort of little uh, piece of aberrant bone uh, that's again just just adjacent to this medial cortex or the distal part of this um, right radius. Um, it, it's difficult to know if, if that constitutes a periosteal reaction or it's just a piece of, of aberrant bone. It, it looks very opaque to me. Um, I think it's, it's less likely to be um, some periosteum and more likely to be a piece of aberrant bone. But I, but as, as you described, there are a few little um, what look to be raised areas of periosteum again, just on the medial surface of that distal radius. Um, in the medial lateral view, it, as you say, it's, it's difficult really to, to really appreciate this lesion, and it would help um, if we uh, had the contralateral limb here, because we could compare the medial lateral views um, on the right and on the left, but the um, normal trabecular pattern of that radius distally here just looks like it's a little bit disrupted. And I think that that's the best we're gonna get from this medial lateral view. 
Um, so when we're trying to decide whether a lesion is um, benign or aggressive, um, we only really need to have a single feature that's compatible with aggressive bone disease to start leaning towards um, a monoostotic aggressive bone lesion. And uh, here we, we've got um, this, this cortical destruction, uh, which certainly fits more with an aggressive bone lesion. Um, we've also got this area of lysis here, which, which even though the zonal transition is quite short and clear, um, it is difficult to know really what else that could be combined with this area of cortical destruction other than something that, that's aggressive. Um, is, there, is there anything else that you guys might consider here other than um, a monoostotic aggressive bone lesion um, like an osteosarcoma? Any, anything else that, that you, you might consider um, before um, nailing this down as uh, an aggressive bone lesion like an osteosarcoma? Osteomyelitis? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I can't say that this this isn't osteomyelitis. So I mean, it would be kind of strange to have such a focal area of, of osteomyelitis, and this would be quite an unusual location. Um, usually, with osteomyelitis, you tend to get um, sclerosis of the bone as well as uh, lysis of the bone. And, and here, I'm not really convinced that the adjacent bone is particularly sclerotic. And we also tend to get more of a periosteal reaction with osteomyelitis. And um, you, you certainly um, can get um, columnar and and palisading periosteal reactions with osteomyelitis, that would be very typical, but it, it would typically be more, more exuberant than this. So anytime you have an aggressive bone lesion on the list of differentials, then um, osteomyelitis absolutely needs to be on the list as well. You can't completely rule it out, um, particularly if you have animals that have come from overseas, particularly in the States. So you know you, you can't completely rule out a fungal osteomyelitis. Um, I think it's, it's less likely, but it's, it's definitely on the list there. Um, anything else that you might consider here? Could it be a cyst? Uh, yeah, so I mean a, a cyst would be a differential if we were more convinced that this was a, a benign bone lesion, so an osseous cyst-like lesion. And without without this area of, of cortical destruction here, then I would say yeah, absolutely. So you know this is this this lesion it, it, it is lytic, but it has a short um, very clean, very sharp zone of transition. So we can't completely rule that out. But, but because we've got this discontinuity of the cortex, I wouldn't really expect a cyst to do that. So um, I can't completely rule out that this, this isn't something aggressive here, but I think it's further down the list. Anything else that you guys might consider? Here? So the only other thing that, that crossed my mind when I was looking at these radiographs. Um, there is a condition called um, stenosing tenosynovitis of the abductor pollicis longus tendon. Um, and that's a tendon that just sort of sits on the medial aspect um, of the carpus. And occasionally um, it gets um, very inflamed. Um, and if it gets inflamed very chronically, then you start to get um, soft tissue swelling and enthesiophytes forming within the tendon. And uh, this area of soft tissue swelling and this uh, just focal area of aberrant bone formation, it, it's it's compatible with uh, something associated with the abductor pollicis longus tendon. Now, what doesn't fit with uh, stenosing tenosynovitis of the abductor pollicis longus is you wouldn't necessarily expect to see this area of lysis, and you certainly wouldn't expect to see any evidence of cortical destruction. So that was something else that, that I considered here. Um, is this just a really strange uh, chronic um, tendonitis? Um, is it a tendonitis that's affecting the abductor pollicis longus tendon? And um, is it an unusual case? So is it is it such is it a, um, a such a chronic um, tendonitis that we've started to see some changes to the bone? Um, I actually ran these radiographs past a colleague and, and we had a chat about some of the changes and we kind of concluded that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see any cortical destruction and, and really this, this area of lysis um, is too extensive for it to be just uh, associated with a chronic tendinopathy. Um, so I mean, we, uh, our conclusion essentially was um, the same as you guys. So we, we concluded that it's most likely because we've got this um, cortical destruction, which is something that we'd expect to see with an aggressive bone lesion, it's most likely that this is a monoostotic aggressive bone lesion. And so the top differentials would be um, something sinister, like a primary bone tumor, an osteosarcoma, or an osteomyelitis. Um, and it, it may be less likely it's it's something like a chronic tumor of the abductor pollicis longus tendon. 
though, because there are some features of this lesion that would fit with that. Um, the, soft, the soft tissue swelling, the, the aberrant bone on the medial aspect of this distal radius, um, that would fit with the carotid osteoarthritis. But um, overall, um, we agree. Um, so the, the final conclusion here was that there is a feature of aggressive bone disease here. It is, there is some cortical destruction. So we have to consider um, a monoostotic aggressive bone lesion as being our top differential. So that's what we settled on. So yeah, nice job. Um, one of the reasons why this is in there is, is uh, essentially, again, to review the uh, features of aggressive versus non-aggressive bone disease, and also to make you guys aware of um, this disease, um, this uh, stenosing tenosynovitis of the abductor pollicis longus. And um, if you're reviewing dogs that have a chronic forelimb lameness and you see uh, changes associated with the medial aspect of the carpus or the distal radius, a particularly soft tissue swelling and an aberrant bone formation like this. That's something that you might want to have on a differential list. Um, as I say, you don't typically get this lysis in this cortical destruction, but if you've never heard of that condition, then now you have, and you can go away and maybe have um, a little read around it. Um, so yeah, good job. That is case number one. Does anybody have any questions about case number one? And if you don't want to speak out, then you can communicate uh, via the chat, uh, because uh, I can see any comments that you guys uh, have about any of these cases via the chat. Um, can I just ask you a quick one, please? Ian? Yeah. Um, so the, that little projection that I thought was columnar, is, is, yeah, is that the anesthesia fight that you're describing? Uh, no. So uh, in terms of it, so if, say, say this, this cortex here was uh, complete and contiguous, and this area of lysis didn't exist, then usually in these uh, dogs that have this this chronic tenosynovitis of the dexaplicus longus, you see big anthesia fights like like this. Right. So so my my concern would be in terms of coming up with differentials whether this this focal aberrant bone represents a large anthesia fight within the abductor pollicis longus tendon. This right. this thing here, I think, as you say, is more likely to be some periosteal reaction. Whereas I don't really know what what this is. Um, and it could be an anesthesia fight in the abductor pollicis longus, or it could be related to whatever's going on in this bone here. There are a lot of lysis with chronic destruction. It, it could be that this this little fragment has originated from this distal radius, and that's why we've got this discontinuous medial distal radial cortex. Um, so yeah, that that would be the thing that I would I would think is that is that a whole bunch of big anesthesia fights? I think. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, as long as you guys are all happy, let's, uh, let's move on to case number two. So case number two uh, is an elderly female new to domestic short hair that's presented to you as uh, Tachypnic. Um, so uh, this is it's a fairly recent case. So who would like to take case number two? So we've got a lateral. It's probably a right lateral. It's kind of a catagram. So we've got thorax and abdomen, and we've got a DV uh, catagram. So we've got thorax and we've got abdomen to have a look at as well. But it's, it's the thorax that we're most interested in. Anybody fancy case number two? It's a nice case. And I do have a definitive answer for you on this one. So all will be revealed. There's tons of you guys. Who's feeling brave? I, I I'll give it a go. Yep. Yeah. Any, anybody fancy it? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give it a go, the name. Yeah, excellent. Um, so there is a well-defined soft tissue or fluid opacity in the dorsocaudal lung field. Yeah. Um, on the DV, it looks to be on the left side. So okay. we've got sort of loss of um, thoracic volume, lung volume on that side. Yeah. Um, I felt initially I thought I'm, I could see the whole diaphragm line. But I'm not actually sure very, very laterally on the left side. I think there could be a discontinuity because the, the gas pattern cranially in the abdomen is odd enough and there's almost like a little bleb of of gas odd looking gas pattern in the very 
um, called a lung fill, but I did wonder if there was um, an abdominal viscous in, in the chest. So like okay. a, a, some sort of hernia, diaphragmatic or um, similar. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that, was mainly, that was mainly it. Okay, no, I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with those findings. So um, in the lateral view, um, we have got this, this area of increased opacity in the dorsal caudal thorax. And it's, it's really curious because it is quite clearly marginated and um, it's roughly sort of triangular shaped. And um, it's difficult really to see it in the DV view, except as you pointed out, that there is quite a stark difference between the left caudal lung lobe versus the right caudal lung lobe. So if you look at the right caudal lung lobe, um, it looks like it's, it's fully inflated and it's an appropriate size. And if we look at the left caudal lung lobe, um, it, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, so, um, uh, that sounds like a plane taking off in the background. Um, so yeah, um, so in the left, in the left caudal lung lobe, um, it looks really dinky, so it's, it's way smaller than the right caudal lung lobe. And as well as the fact that this left caudal lung lobe is small relative to the right, um, we have got an unusual opacity in the left caudal thorax. And there is some effacement of the margins of the diaphragm associated with that as well. Now, whether or not that effacement is as a result of a diaphragmatic rupture um, or something else uh, remains to be seen. Uh, certainly just because we have some effacement of the margins of the diaphragm doesn't necessarily mean that there's a rupture. So if you have um, two tissues that are a similar density adjacent to one another, then that will eliminate the margins between them because they'll have the same opacity on the radiograph. So it could be that there is something within the thorax here or within the pleural space um, that is a similar opacity to a similar density to the soft tissues adjacent to it within that cranial abdomen. And that could create a, a similar, that could look very similar. So you, you get a facement of the margins of the diaphragm in that instance. In, in the lateral view, the diaphragm looks, looks pretty good actually. So um, we can see it right the way from the spine, right the way down to the sternum. Um, and a lot of the cranial abdominal organs, um, they, they look like where they look like they are where they should be. So we, we can see the liver, and um, we can see the stomach and some of the gas in the stomach. And um, we can see the other abdominal organs, we can see the small intestines and the bladder, and then a really gas-filled large bowel. So I think a diaphragmatic rupture is, is less likely here, um, but certainly there's something going on in this left caudal lung lobe. So the other thing to consider, because we can't really see the cardiac silhouette particularly well, in this DV view, there's maybe some effacement of the margins of this cardiac silhouette. And if we look a little bit more closely at just the uh, kind of the, the caudal part of this left caudal lung lobe, uh, you could just maybe get the impression that there might be some retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall here. So if we've got um, some effacement of the diaphragmatic margins, maybe some effacement of the cardiac silhouette, and maybe a little bit of retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. It could be that there's just a really small volume pleural effusion here. Um, but that doesn't really account for the fact that this, this left lung lobe um, looks a lot smaller than this uh, right caudal lung lobe. And this triangular shaped opacity in the lateral view, that, that could potentially be a collapsed left caudal lung lobe. That, that would fit with the fact that the left caudal lung lobe looks much smaller and much more radiopaque in the DV view relative to the right caudal lung lobe. So what we've got is um, this triangular shaped increase in opacity in the dorsal caudal thorax in this lateral view. Um, we've got uh, a, a cranial displacement of the left diaphragmatic crease relative to the right in this DV view. And we've got an associated effacement of the borders of the cardiac silhouette and the lateral margins of the left diaphragmatic cruise with potentially some retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. So uh, I think for me, we, we can say, okay, it's it, it, it's a good bet that this left caudal lung lobe looks like it's it's collapsed. And there could be a little bit of pleural effusion here as well. Um, so does, does any anybody else have anything to add to our description so far? I mean, we, we, we're pretty confident that we're looking at a cat that has a collapsed left caudal lung lobe. But at the moment, we don't really have a good reason for that. The fact that we have got an elderly cat with, with a collapsed lung lobe 
and a plural effusion, what what are you guys thinking that this, this could potentially be? Could you have a pulmonary embolism um, potentially due to cardiac disease? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good thought. So anytime you see uh, triangular shaped lesions, um, so we've got this, this, this triangular shaped lesion here, um, something thinking about an infarct and embolism is, is absolutely the right thing to do. So uh, if you have um, a pulmonary thromboembolism and it's cutting off the blood supply to typically um, the, the dorsocaudal lung and the periphery of the dorsocaudal lung, you're going to get a triangular shaped lesion. So uh, PTE is um, absolutely a reasonable thing to think about here. And, and it was absolutely on my differential list when I looked at these radiographs. Now, uh, if you have a PTE, it could potentially be associated with primary cardiac disease. Um, if you look at the heart, it doesn't look particularly big in this lateral view. Pulmonary vessels kind of look okay. There's no evidence of a big pulmonary artery or a big pulmonary vein. And in the DVV as well, um, the pulmonary vessels look okay. You can see them here on the right. And I mean, we have got some effacement of the cardiac silhouette, so it's tricky to see it but it doesn't look particularly big. In fact, um, if we look a bit more closely at the heart, we might even be convinced that there's actually a little bit of media style shift towards the left. So the positioning here is pretty good. So the cat's pretty straight, um, but the heart just looks like it's just shifting a little bit towards the left side, which again would fit with the left lung lobe being collapsed. So if, if you get a lung lobe that, that is reduced in volume because it's collapsed, then the mediastinal structures, including the heart, are going to drift to that side to fill the gap filled by the reduction in volume of that collapsed lobe. So the fact that we've got a left-sided mediastinal shift here, again, just adds additional weight to our theory that, that this left lung lobe has collapsed. But yeah, uh, a PTE, absolutely, that was uh, in my mind as well as, as potentially a differential here. Anything else that you guys might, might be thinking about, given that we're now super confident that this left lung lobe has collapsed? Primary carcinoma? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you've got an older cat and you've got a collapsed lung lobe, and it is not uncommon for a primary pulmonary neoplasia, like bronchialveolar carcinomas, to have a peribronchial distribution. So these tumors form around the lobar bronchi, and if they start to infiltrate compress that bronchus, then that can impede the airflow through that bronchus. And as a result of that, you get secondary unload collapse. So we need to be really cautious here. Is, is there a mass in this cat's lungs that might be responsible for the collapse of this left cord lung lobe and potentially also associated with a small volume fluid effusion? Now, I don't really think we can see a mass convincingly in this lateral view and um, we, we can see the, the collapsed lobe uh, we can't say that that's definitely not a, a pte but given the way that the dv view looks i think it's more likely that that that, that actually represents just a, a really empty squished up left cord lung lobe and looking at the dv it, it, it's it's really tricky to to see a mass lesion because we've got uh, this small volume pleural effusion which is making it difficult for us to see the heart and, and difficult for us to see the edges of the diaphragm, particularly in the left caudal thorax. Um, I, I just wondered whether or not there might just be a really slight increase in opacity um, just in the left caudal thorax, just superimposed over the cardiac cinema here. It just looks a little bit more opaque here than it otherwise should. And it's on the left side, so not really any structures there that should be um, causing an increase in opacity in this region. The caudal vena cave is going to be over here. Is, is there something in this region? that might be responsible for that collapsed left cord lung. Now, that's that's pretty much as far as I got um, with these radiographs. So um, I was um, pretty confident that, that this left cord lung lobe was collapsed. And my concern, given that this was an older cat, was that there was some sort of mass lesion that was responsible for the collapse of that left cord lung lobe. So uh, something like a primary bronchialveolar carcinoma is, is quite high on the differential list here because it's difficult to think of many other things that would, would result in just collapse of a single lung lobe. So this cat ended up in the CT scanner and we can take a look at CT. So let me just play this through for you guys. So this is a 1.25 millimeter lung reconstruction of this cat's onions. So uh, these, these are, oops, let me just get my laser pointer out. So these are the lungs here. These are the bronchi. This is the heart. And we can see there's a lesion here. 
So I'm going to play that through again for you. I'm going to do it much slower this time. Okay, this is cranial thorax. We're starting to see the ribs. We're starting to see the lungs here. <clears throat> Not too concerned about anything that we're seeing so far. We can maybe come back and look at some of the lesions that we've picked up. But just here, if I just run this through, we've got this. It's clearly marginated, partially mineral, soft tissue attenuating mass that uh, is associated with the uh, left caudal lobar bronchus. So, I mean, that mass was really tricky to see in the radiographs, but there it is on the CT. If we just run it cranially and we start just to try and follow these bronchi. So let's, let's go here and we'll just take a little look. So this is, this is the trachea at the level of the hyalus. So this is just cranial to the point where the trachea is going to bifurcate and they're going to see the left main stem and the right main stem bronchus. So I'm going to run it, run it on from there. If we just keep following that left main stem bronchus, it's going to become the left caudal lobar bronchus. I'll just point that out for you. Just here. And we'll just run it on. And we can see that, that that bronchus is just completely eliminated by that mass. Um, so that mass has an absolutely typical peribronchial distribution that fits beautifully with a primary bronchial alveolar carcinoma. So primary lung tubes in cats and in dogs, they tend to be larger, they tend to be solitary, they tend to be peribronchial and partially mineralized. And this mass lesion ticks all of those boxes. And on the CT, uh, we can see the uh, collapse of the left caudal lung lobe that's associated with this uh, mass lesion. So here we've got the right caudal lung lobe, which is nicely inflated, and then here we've got a really sweet left press core, um, which also is high attenuating relative to the right. So this left caudal lung lobe is really struggling to get inflated because this mass that's surrounding this left caudal lobe bronchus is just squishing it. So there's just no air it can get into this left caudal lung lobe. So it's all squished up and collapsed, which is what we've seen on the radiograph. If we just run this CT forward ever so slightly, unfortunately there's, there's a couple of areas in these lungs that, that look like they could be nodules. So um, it's, it's pretty difficult to explain this focal hyperattenuating area here, which is probably in the caudal part of the left cranial lung lobe. Other than that, that probably represents a nodule. There are a few other areas as well. So there's an area here just which is probably now the right cranial lung lobe which also looks like it could be a nodule so again it's, it's not uncommon to have a primary pulmonary neoplasia like a bronchial alveolar carcinoma large solitary peribronchial soft tissue mass partially mineralized and then to have metastasis within the lung as a result of the primary pulmonary neoplasia and that's that's our primary differential here so unfortunately um, the collapse of that left caudal lung lobe we can see in the radiographs is as a result of a large peribronchial mass lesion which which did turn out to be a um, bronchial viola carcinoma now we'll just play that through so just one of the things for you guys to <clears throat> have a go at in practice. So not, not all of these mass lesions are, are this difficult to see on radiographs. So you guys are going to have patients that are going to present to you, elderly patients that are going to be dyspneic or coughing. And you can take thoracic radiographs and you're going to see uh, solitary, large solitary soft tissue mass lesions in the middle. And if they're peripheral, then it is, it is infinitely possible to FNA these lesions. Um, that's how we got the diagnosis here. Um, so we, we popped the probe on and uh, we FNA'd it. So this is a single ultrasound image that I took when I was FNAing uh, this lesion. And you can see that the mass lesion is, is just here. So when you're looking for these masses on ultrasound, essentially when you pop, pop the probe on the lung normally, you should just see reverberation artifacts. So you should just see the lung edges. Um, you shouldn't really be able to see anything else. And if you're sliding your probe um, up and down the thorax in between the ribs, 
um, or forward and backwards in between the groups, um, then you're looking for kind of any areas of discontinuity where you, you haven't got that, that beautiful sharp margining that represents the inflated lung edge and the reverberation artifact. And, and here um, we, we, we could see the mass. So, um, this one, I was really challenging my arm because um, it, it's quite medial, this mass lesion. Um, it, it, it looked immediately ventral to the spine, so I wasn't really sure that we'd be able to see it. But, but there it is, um, and you can see there's, there's multiple hyper-echoic foci within this mass, which probably represent the little mineralized areas that we can see on the CT. So I was able to, to get a needle into this thing, and it was compatible with um, a primary bronchial viola carcinoma. Um, so yeah, that was um, a fairly recent case. Um, Pretty typical of the sort of stuff that um, you guys are going to see in first opinion practice. Um, so yeah, primary bronchialveolar carcinomas tend to be large, solitary, partially mineralized of a peribronchial distribution. And if you see one and you're looking to nail on the diagnosis and it looks like it's peripheral on the DV radiograph, don't be afraid to pop the probe onto the lung and see if you can get a needle in it. Because if you can, then quite often um, you can get your diagnosis. And that's always good. We've got the diagnosis nailed on. Okay, <clears throat> anybody have any questions about case number two? Um, is it, Ian, is it correct to call them low bar signs at the margins of the triangle, or is that, or is that not right? Um, just in the lateral x ray? This, this thing? Yeah. Um, so, so low bar sign, I mean, typically it's used when you have. Uh, a, an aerated lung that is abutting a consolidated lung. So, I mean, my understanding of it, it's essentially the margin between a normal lung and abnormal lung. Now here, we're not looking at a consolidated lung. So this lung is, is collapsed rather than consolidated. So its volume is, is reduced. So that means it's collapsed rather than um, either uh, equivalent or increased. So if the lung was consolidated, then the volume would stay the same. It's just that the alveoli within that lung lobe and the interstitial would be filled with infiltrate. Uh, I don't think it would be wrong. I, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have used the term low bar sign to, to describe this because it, it because it isn't consolidation. Uh, but I'm struggling to think of a reason why you might be wrong in using that, given my understanding of the term. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I think that probably be sure. Thanks. All right, any other questions about number two? Are there fissure line on the DV view? Uh, I think I think here there's there's a small volume effusion. Uh, whether or not I would call that a fissure, I'm not sure. So uh, I, I don't think, I think the edges that we can see here are because we've got some retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the wall rather than fluid between the lung lobes. So for me, a fissure line is, you know, you, you can see the division between two lung lobes because there's fluid between the two. Um, I think probably the division between the left cranial and the left caudal is going to be somewhere up here. Um, I can't quite see that. I, I probably wouldn't have used the term fissure line. I, I would have said there's effacement of the margins of the diaphragm. I would have said there's retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, but I'm, I'm not convinced I would have said fissure. Thank you. Okay, everybody happy with case number two? I mean, it's a tricky case. I mean, we, you know, we needed a CT to get to the bottom of it, but this is a, this is a real case. So this is a case that, that you know we saw recently at LBS. All right, so bringing us on to another real case, which we saw recently. This is a three-year-old, sorry, five, case number three, five-year-old male neutered Labrador, and it's vomiting, which is not uncommon for a five-year-old Labrador. So, uh, who would like to do case number three, which is some abdominal films? So we've got two abdominal films, we've got a left lateral, and we've got a VD of this Labrador's tummy. So we've had an orthopedic case, we've had a thoracic case, and now this is, this is our first abdominal case of the evening. So who fancies getting in amongst it, as far as the abdomens are concerned? I can do it if you want. Yeah, good. Okay, we have two radiograph projections. One is a left lateral and the other one is a VD. Um, there is just the cranial part, just the cranial portion of the abdomen essentially is included. Yep. 
Um, on the left lateral, regarding the skeletally, uh, skeletal structure, uh, there is a um, partial um, bridging newborn formation within, uh, within L3 and L4, yep. which is likely to be age-related, like with spondylosis, so it's not clinically relevant. And regarding the muscular structure included, they cannot see any other abnormalities. Okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> there is probably a subtle decrease of serosa details within the abdomen, probably more obvious um, in the VD view. Um, the stomach, yeah, um, the stomach is uh, partially gas-filled on the left lateral in the region of the pylorus. And yep. the region of the fundus um, show a sort of mixed pattern. I, I can see a sort of, yeah, a phasing of, it's a sort of between fluid, gas, and soft tissue opacity. Okay. Um, we can follow the, the, py the pyloric antrum and the duodenum, yep. and then we can partially see, um, like, um, small intestinal loops, gas field, and fluid field. Yep. The gas field, essentially, they, they face the fluid field. And we can see possible, um, is it just in the mid-abdomen, just adjacent to the, to the end of the ribs, the 12th, probably fecal material within the transverse colon, the proximal tract of the transverse colon. Yep. Um, and then we can see the um, kidney silhouette, the renal silhouette, um, yeah, which they look pretty normal to me. Yep. Um, I think within the DVD, we can see pretty the same things. We can see gas field pylorus, and we can see like, um, gas field, small intestinal loops, and fluid field. Yeah. Um, so I, to be honest with you, I can, I can, yeah, there are two population of um, of gastrointestinal tract, but they are not so dilated, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I, I cannot be an hundred percent <coughs> sure that is a foreign body. We know it's a Labrador. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I may ask for an abdominal ultrasound if it's possible. Uh, the, the area of the stomach it may be a, a bit dodgy to me, but it may be just food, food uh, with, with fluid within the stomach. So yeah, okay, no, I, I yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, so just just before we talk about this anymore, um, if if by the chat you guys can maybe. Make your feelings known. So what would you guys do with this case? So uh, we're potentially going to take it for an abdominal ultrasound. Um, anybody disagree? Anybody would cut this dog? Anybody would just send this dog home and go, ah, it's probably fine. It's just got gastroenteritis. Um, anybody would do anything else? Just to get uh, an idea of uh, how, how the group is feeling about these radios. Okay, yeah, so most people, yeah, going down the additional imaging is required. So um, ultrasound um, or potentially a uh, barium study. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 pretty reasonable. And, and that, that's kind of where I got to with these radiographs, to be honest. So um, I absolutely agree with your radiographic appraisal here. So we've got um, a left actual abdominal radiograph. Um, the collimation, uh, the centering is not great. So we really have only got the cranial um, and part of the mid abdomen here so um, they're not great films um, we we can see some gas um, in the antrum and the pylorus extending towards the duodenum because this is a left lateral view uh, we're not seeing anything stuck in the pylorus which is good so always good to take um, a left lateral view in patients that are suspicious uh, might have an obstruction a mechanical ileus because um, in the left lateral view if you have something just wadged in the pylorus then the gas is going to go to the um, to the non-dependent part of the abdomen, and it's going to outline that structure that could be wanted in the pylorus. But there's, there's nothing there. 
And then we've got a few kind of gas filled loops of bowel. Um, some of them are a bit bigger than others, but none of them are particularly dilated. Um, so there's not really much to get too excited about here. This, this is kind of a VDV, so we've got some gas in the antrum. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of um, small intestine. Uh, it, it's got some gas in it, but it, it doesn't look huge. Eh, it's, it's, it's not really something that we're getting too excited about. Now, the, the only thing that did catch my eye on these radiographs, not, not in the lateral view, um, but in this VD view, is, is this structure here. So we've got this, this focal area of mottled radiopacity. It's, it's, it's roughly ovoid, um, and it's in the, the right sort of cranial abdomen. Now, that, that could potentially be just fecal material, but it's in a really kind of funny place for feces, because we, we, we think we can maybe see the transverse colon, as you alluded to, and, and maybe the, the descending colon here, and, and that's, that's a long way away from this thing. And you know, we've, we've got a dog, it's a Labrador, it's, it's been vomiting, um, and if you do have um, obstructions, foreign bodies that are in the duodenum, then quite often they'll just vomit up all the stuff that's in the duodenum and in the stomach. So the duodenum and the stomach look empty, despite the fact that they're obstructed. And the fact that we've got this thing here that, that is just potentially could be in the duodenum. I mean, it's it's on the right side of the abdomen. It doesn't really look like it's in the colon. That that, that potentially could could be something. I'm not really sure we can see it in in this lateral view. Um, but in, in in the VD view, that, that kind of worries me ever so slightly. Um, so what what happened uh, in this case um, is I had a chat to the uh, vet who was taking care of this Labrador and said, you know, there's, there's something here that I'm not entirely pleased about. Yeah, maybe just pop the probe on and let's see if you can see anything in the duodenum. Um, so I did that, couldn't couldn't really see anything in the duodenum. Um, and so then I uh, took some more radiographs. So these radiographs are about oh, maybe 12 hours later. Uh, so we've got two more radiographs to look at. And yeah, uh, so we can carry on down the same line or, or somebody else can have a go at interpreting these, however you guys like. Who wants to have a little look at these? Now, I understand that you guys haven't seen these radiographs before. So essentially... I can, have, I can keep you, going if you yeah, want. Yeah, keep going. So, so I understand you've not seen these before. So, um, you know, we, we're kind of uh, asking for kind of blind reads now, which is which is more challenging. Uh, but yeah, why don't you have a, have a, have a look at these and, and see what you're making. So this is a right lateral. Yep. Okay, so in this, I'm, I'm expecting essentially in a right lateral to see gas within the stomach fundus and to see the pylorus, uh, yeah. the region of the pylorus, like fluid field essentially. But I can see there is this sort of um, C comma shaped mm. uh, gas opacity there, yeah. which I, I, I'm not expecting to be there essentially. Yeah, I agree. Which is quite is quite odd to me, and 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 then we can see we can see part of the tail of the spleen on the on the ventral part of the abdomen, and we can see a sort of um, yeah, like teardrop shape um, in just caudal to the to the spleen. Um, we can see this gas filled um, small intestinal loops. Yeah. That, that essentially remind to me the linear foreign body cut. So okay. they have pretty the same the same shape. Yeah. Um, and can, can I have a look at the at the DB yeah. as well? Yeah, no. so so I absolutely agree. So we've got well, this loop of, of bowel here that it's difficult to know what that is. Um, if, if, if that's small intestine, then that is a, is a worry because that is it's yeah. super dimensional. And then, as you say, we've got these loops of, of bowel in the mid-abdomen. And the distribution now looks a little bit concerning because they, they look like they're a little bit stacked up. They're, they're not super big, these loops of bowel, but they're considerably smaller than this loop of bowel. So if, if this is small bowel and this is small bowel, and we've got two populations of small bowel, one of which is dilated, which which is all a bit of a worry. So that's that's our VD. Yeah, essentially we can see the same, probably the same C shape re reverted, um, a phasing part of the stomach, isn't it? Yeah. On the on the left um, on the left um, cranial abdomen, essentially. Yeah. And. 
and we can see like mixed um, gas field and fluid field um, small intestinal loops. Yeah, absolutely. So so now we've we've got this loop of bowel here, which which is almost certainly small bowel. It's really difficult to believe that that's large bowel, and and this is this is really quite dilated relative to the other loops of bowel that we can see. This this could also be small bowel, um, but we don't really need um, two dilated loops. We've we've got this one. It's it, it's too big. There's two populations of small bowel, um, so we're really concerned now that this dog has um, a mechanical ileus and obstruction. And this this thing, yes. so previously, is still there. Um, that, yeah. that, that hasn't really done anything. So um, the, the fact that previously we were concerned about this, the structure, this sort of poorly marginated, roughly ovoid, mottled area of um, radiopacity, that's still exactly where it was when we left it 24 hours later. So so now, now we're, we're pretty concerned. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so what do you think? Should we, should we cut this dog at this point? Well, I think open up. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> so at this point, I think you can be confident to say that we're very, very strongly suspicious that this dog has um, mechanical ileus in the foreign body. Don't know what this thing is in, in the right cranial abdomen, but that's that's probably the foreign body. So, yeah, this dog, this dog was obstructed, did have a foreign body. So the next the next question is for you guys: What do you think this thing is? This this was the foreign body, and it, and it was stuck in the duodenum. Um, so just for fun, any ideas of what this thing is? And you can uh, you can uh, vote on 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 the chat if you like. So it's not a corn cob <laughs> we've had, because we've had a few corn cobs <laughs> recently, but it is it is something similar. So so this thing uh, yeah a piece of tennis ball yeah that's a good suggestion it's not it's not a tennis ball. So this thing actually turned out to be a peach stone. So this was a fruit stone in this dog, and uh, yeah it was causing. A mechanical ileus. Um, so uh, yeah, fruit stone in this Labrador. Um, blocked up a studenum and needed to be cut. So yeah, this was a really nice case because uh, I think it really helped to take a second series of radiographs. So um, in the initial set of radiographs, I, I wouldn't have advised to cut this dog necessarily. Um, there was the structure that, that we were concerned about, but we weren't convinced that there was enough evidence of the mechanical ileus to recommend XLAB. But given a little bit of time, um, there's now several features that make us very concerned about the foreign body and the mechanical ileus. We've got dilated loops of small bowel, we've got two different populations of small bowel, and the structure that we were concerned about previously, the, that we thought could be a foreign body, that hasn't moved. So we're now super confident that, that this isn't fecal material, that that isn't in the large bowel, <coughs> that is something. Uh, they shouldn't be there, and it's in the small bowel. <coughs> it's most likely a foreign body. <coughs> so yeah, good job. <coughs> so this was a case where, um, you know, it, it had had an ultrasound. This this case, and and we weren't able to, to see this foreign body. So you know, it can be really tricky to to see foreign bodies on ultrasound. And so there is nothing wrong with with taking some additional abdominal radiographs. It can be super useful. Um, and yeah, it could, can mean that when you do decide to go in, you're super confident that you're going to find something. So yeah, nice job. So last case of the evening <coughs> is a 12-year-old female neutered golden retriever that has presented to you with a lump on his chest. So this is, I mean, essentially another set of uh, thoracic radiographs for you guys to have a look at. Um, so we've got uh, three views this time. Um, so we've got a right lateral, uh, we've got a dorsal ventral and we've got a left ventral. So, anyone fancy taking case number four, the last case of the evening? Oh, it's a, it's a nice one. Nobody feeling brave enough. I can take it. Yeah, excellent. That always makes me happy. Um, on the lateral, I think it was a right lateral. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, I thought that it was probably a conscious uninflated view because there's not very much space in there. And it gives it a like a diffuse interstitial pattern a little bit, but generally, but mainly in the cranial lung lobes. Yeah, yeah. That's more just because of the fact that it's not inflated. 
Yep. Um, and the heart looks quite rounded, um, but there's, it doesn't look like it's elevating the trachea. Um, and again, I think it's just because it's on a right lateral uninflated view. Yep. Um, and then I think it was a DV view. Yep. Um, next one. Yeah. Um, I think that it's the mass on the. Um, I think that was the left hand side. Yeah, I think it was the left. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like it's coming from the ribs themselves. It just looks like it's a soft tissue mass to me. Yep. Um, and again, I well, not again. I can't see any metastasis in the lungs. Um, and then the same on the left lateral view. Um, I again, the trachea doesn't look elevated, um, and I can't see any metastasis in the lungs. And there's a bit of an interstitial pattern. Okay. Yeah. I've not really got that one. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, and so I absolutely agree. So um, we, we've seen this this lump on the chest. So this is the reason why uh, this dog has come in, because there's this sort of soft tissue opaque mass that's just appeared um, on its thorax. So um, what we need to try and decide is, uh, is there any involvement of any of the ribs? Um, and is there anything else going on in this thorax that we need to be concerned about? And I agree, looking at these radiographs, it's really difficult to convince yourself that, that any of these ribs are involved. So look at the cortices of the adjacent ribs and they all look like they're pretty intact and the opacity of these ribs also looks, looks pretty appropriate. Pretty difficult to convince yourself that there's there's any periosteal reaction here that might indicate that this, this wasn't a soft tissue tumour, this is maybe, say, a tumour that's originating um, from one of these ribs, um, like an osteosarcoma or a chondrosarcoma. But <clears throat> given that we've got this soft tissue mass, uh, we're absolutely on the lookout for metastasis here. Um, so I think there are some nodules in these lungs that we can see on these radiographs. They're tricky to see in the lateral views, but on this DV view, there's, there's, a, there's at least one that, um, that should clue you in that there's something going oh, on. Oh, actually, I think I can see yeah. um, yeah. Is there one in the level with the, with the label on the left-hand side, just yeah. the diaphragm? Yeah, so no, you, you're absolutely in the right ballpark. So, so this 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 thing I think is just mineralization of the costochondral junctions, but there's there's something here. So that that thing shouldn't really be there. So so that's that's a focal area of increased capacity. It's poorly marginated, but it's it's pretty round, and that could potentially be a nodule. And if we go back to the lateral views, it's pretty tricky to see in that right lateral view. Um, in the left lateral view, again, this is this is sneaky and it's pretty tricky. If if you look at the aorta, um, you can see the aorta in the dorsal thorax here. But ju just at this level, you can see that there are some ribs superimposed on the aorta here, but there's definitely a focal area of increased opacity. And that little focal area of increased opacity could could absolutely represent this this little area here, which which could potentially be a lung nodule. There's, there's a couple of other little areas that, that could potentially be nodules that, that there may be, that, that could potentially just be mineralization of costochondral junctions, but that might be a little nodule. Um, those those were the two that um, I was concerned about, particularly this one. So so that one, I was uh, that, that could definitely be um, a, a, a nodule. And if it is a nodule, and um, we've got this soft tissue mass that potentially could be something neoplastic, then we've got to be concerned about pulmonary metastasis. Normally, if you just have a solitary lung nodule, I wouldn't necessarily get too concerned about it. Just a solitary nodule could be anything. It could be something benign, like a hematoma or a granuloma. Um, if you have multiple pulmonary nodules, that's when you start to get more concerned about pulmonary metastasis. Um, in, this, in this dog, we've got this, this soft tissue mass lesion, which could be something neoplastic. So the fact that we can see a nodule view means that we're a little bit more concerned that there could be metastasis here. Um, so fortunately, and I agree that these, these are not the best set of films, so I absolutely agree that, that these are expiratory. Um, I think the heart looks kind of chunky because they're expiratory and there really isn't any gap at all between the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm and either of those lateral views. And <clears throat> I agree that this diffuse interstitial pattern is probably due to the fact that they're expiratory films rather than <clears throat> any pulmonary pathology. Now, fortunately, uh, we've got the benefit of the CT in this dog as well. So 
Uh, what I thought we'd do is just uh, play this CT through for you guys initially. Um, so we're starting at the front. Um, so we've got the, the scapula, we've got the thoracic spine starting here. We can see the ribs. There's our big mass, uh, which is partially mineralized. And then as we move cordially through the thorax, um, we can see that there are a couple of, of nodules here. Um, so that little area there is the nodule that we can see on the radiographs. There. And if we just run through it a little more, you can see that there are a couple of other nodules as well that were really tricky to see on the radiographs. I think there's another one right at the back, yeah. So there's one there's one right at the back there as well. Over there. Now the other thing <coughs> the CT helped with here. And I absolutely agree that um, <clears throat> based on the radiographs, um, it, it doesn't really look like there's, there's any rib involvement. But if we look at the CT, we can see that the adjacent rib here, there's, there's definitely some evidence of a periosteal reaction. So, so there, is, there is some rib involvement. It, it doesn't look like this is a primary uh, rib lesion. Um, so we're seeing a periosteal reaction adjacent to the mass rather than a mass that looks like it's, it's bursting out of the rib. And it's really destructive and aggressive and there's a huge amount of lysis um, associated with the rib, but, but the ribs certainly are involved as well. <coughs> so and this, this unfortunately turned out to be um, a soft tissue sarcoma um, and, and unfortunately there were multiple pulmonary nodules which uh, most likely represented uh, pulmonary metastasis. So uh, this is just um, a nice example of how tricky it can be to see pulmonary nodules even when they're present. So for me, the only module I can be pretty confident about uh, identifying and, um, and diagnosing on the radiographs was, was this one. Um, there, there are multiple other modules here that we can see on the CT that they weren't visible on the radiographs. And also, um, it was really tricky to, um, to see that rib involvement on the radiographs as well. The, the, the CT makes it clean. And this one I thought was, was fun, um, <clears throat> just because, because of the sneaky pulmonary module. So, um, so this, this, was, this was the thing. That, um, that we were looking for is, can, can, did you guys see that little module there to make you suspicious that there might be something a bit more sinister going on in this patient that would warrant further investigation, um, like a CT scan? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So on the left lateral, there is a round shape of tissue opacity that seems to be superimposed to the vena cava. Would you consider like part of bronchi or would it be this, suspicious of a uh, node or not? Yeah. This, this thing here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's, that's tricky. I, I agree. I think there is a focal area of increased opacity there. Uh, I think it's, it's probably superimposition of other vessels rather than a module, but you could be right that that could be another module. Uh, let's let's just have a quick look at the CT and see what we can see near the, the cave because we're fortunate now that we, uh, we can come back to the CT. So, so this is our cave is pretty uh, Pretty wee, so let me just uh, change to back to my laser. So this is this is our cave view. Let's just run through and see if we can see anything that that might represent. You know what? There could be a little module there. Yeah, yeah, I could buy that. Yeah, well spotted. There's there's a little tiny little module there. So yeah, that you could absolutely be right. That that little area. There could could potentially represent that little module. So yeah, nice, well, well, well spotted. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions about case number four? Okay. Everybody happy? Great. Okay. So that's all the cases that we have for this evening. So hopefully a nice mix. So a little bit of orthopedics, a few thoracic radiographs to look at and abdomen as well. Um, if you guys uh, have any questions about any of these cases, um, then don't hesitate to get in touch. And if you'd like to review some of these cases again or view this session 
um, then it will be available on our website. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much again for joining me this evening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully I will see you all again next month um, for August for the session.